So this is going to be headless Linux KVM. Uh, so some of you may have used KVM before. Uh, KVM is virtualization on Linux, essentially. And so the focus of today is going to be doing it on a headless server. Okay. So you might be asking yourself, uh, isn't everything headless? Uh, most of us are Linux admins, and we spend all of our day in an SSH session or a terminal, and we think, well, of course it's headless. Why would I run anything with a GUI? I don't need a GUI. Uh, well, the only reason that I think this is significant for KVM is if you go to the KVM FAQ uh, uh, at the link below, which is their official project page, um, they have the question, how do I use KVM on a headless machine without a local GUI? And it says very succinctly, install a management tool such as Vert Manager on a remote machine. Full stop. That's all you get. So if you don't have that, well, you're shit out of luck, at least according to them. Uh, now, there are actually quite a few um, uh, command line tools to manage KVM and virtualization on Linux. Um, but they're not mentioned on the uh, KVM project page for some reason. Um, so I'm going to use the word KVM, um, but I wanted to cover a couple of the other names that might come up as part of this. Um, it's particularly confusing if you're new to this and you haven't run any virtual machines on Linux before. Um, you'll encounter the words KVM, QEMU, and probably also libvertd. And what are they? Well. KVM is the kernel module that provides the hardware acceleration for your virtual machines. So prior to KVM, if you were going to run a virtual machine on Linux, uh, there were a couple ways to do it. One of them was the Zen hypervisor, and the other was just straight QEMU. So QEMU, back in the day, and still is if you want it to be, uh, a CPU emulator. So it's actually uh, pretending to be your CPU and it's recompiling all of the uh, CPU instructions that your virtual machine is doing and then running them on the CPU that the system is running. So that's pretty slow um, and is not very useful most of the time unless you're trying to run stuff on a different architecture than your machine is. Uh, so in the case of QEMU with KVM, uh, QEMU did a lot of the legwork on virtualizing things other than the CPU. So your hard drives, your network adapters, uh, all of the other components that are needed in a virtual machine, uh, QEMU had already figured all that out. Um, so there was no reason to reinvent the wheel with KVM. So what the KVM project did when it was first uh, being developed is they just inserted themselves into QEMU and added that hardware acceleration onto the virtualization that QEMU was already doing. And this is all kind of paraphrased. Um, you can look through the history if you want to see. Uh, there's a lot of nuance in exactly what each component is doing, uh, but this is sort of a high-level overview of stuff that uh, uh, really applies to the modern, modern virtualization. And then, so after QEMU, we have libvertd, and also just libvert. So libvert uh, is an abstraction of several different virtualization uh, hypervisors uh, to provide a common interface to running virtual machines on Linux. So rather than having to set things up with QEMU uh, and KVM, um, or if you were going to use a different hypervisor like Zen, uh, everything is different. So what libvert aimed to do was to create a common configuration across all of those uh, and then it does the hard work underneath the scenes of actually figuring out how to run that virtual machine. Um, so libvert does a lot of the hard work for us, and essentially libvert is what's providing the management layer that we're going to be using. So um, the primary commands that we're going to be using are actually libvert CLI tools, and then libvert is interfacing with QEMU and KVM to actually run our virtual machine. Uh, so some of the packages we'll need, um, this is not an exhaustive list, but this is most of the names that you'll need to run uh, yum install with or apt-get install, and it will pull in a whole whack load of dependencies, uh, but these should be the ones that you actually need to install. Uh, so KVM is actually a kernel module, and that hasn't been included in the main line for quite a while now. Um, so if you look on your system, chances are that uh, kernel module is already there. 
QEMU KVM is the binary to run a KVM virtual machine using QEMU. Uh, that installs uh, most of the QEMU packages uh, along with KVM. Uh, libvirt daemon is what allows us to run virtual machines. Um, so libvirt daemon runs in a um, it runs in a day it runs as a daemon, and then we interface with it through a socket. Um, so uh, the advantage of that is the uh, libvirt daemon gets the permissions to actually uh, run with your hardware to interface with your hardware, and then you can delegate those permissions to interface with libvirt. Uh, and the daemon separately from actually interfacing with the hardware. So a user that wants to boot up a virtual machine uh, doesn't actually need to be root in order to bind to all of those the, the hardware. Uh, you just need to be granted access to talk to the libvirt daemon, and then it has it has permission to do what it needs uh, with the system. Uh, oddly, at least on the Ubuntu system that I was running this on, when you install libvirt daemon, Typically, you would expect that if you install a daemon, it's going to come with the systemd unit file or whatever other init system uh, that it is expecting. Uh, but in this case, it does not. So you install libvirt daemon and you expect it, you know, you'd start it with systemctl start libvirt d. Um, and that doesn't work. It says unit not found. So for some reason, they've separated that out and you have to install libvirt daemon system, which installs the systemd unit for libvirt D so that it will actually run automatically. Uh, on top of that, we need libvirt clients. So that's what I was mentioning before. That's our command line tools that we actually use to work with uh, running virtual machines. And we also need vert install or vert inst. Uh, so those are command line tools to automate the creation of the libvirt configuration for a virtual machine. So there's a couple of different layers involved here and if we wanted, we don't need vert install. We can, uh, we can write our libvirt XML from scratch. So uh, that's how libvirt defines a virtual machine and all of its other config. It's using XML files. Uh, so vert install just does the heavy listing of creating that initial XML file. Uh, so like I was saying, libvirt D uh, does the heavy lifting for us. It provisions the virtual machines and the virtual networks. Um, if you were not using libvirt D and you wanted to just run with QEMU using KVM, you can do that. Um, but by default, it's only emulating a single machine. So there's all those other components that it needs. Uh, one of the major, major, major ones is virtual networking. Um, so you can, you can do that all by hand. You can use the IP command, uh, you can create a bridge, and then you can add those routes to uh, your routing table, and then you can bind your virtual machine to the bridge adapter. But you have to do that every single time you boot the machine. And it's not going to boot automatically. Every time you have to run the QEMU command, you have to do that all over again. Uh, and so the only way to save that configuration would actually be to write your own script to automatically do all that. So that's what libvirt D is doing, is it's actually taking all that uh, virtual networking and configuration around that, and it's automating that for us so that it happens every time we need it. So when we talk about a virtual machine in the context of libvirt D, uh, it's referring, it refers to them as domains. Uh, so a domain is essentially a virtual machine, and they're defined in an XML format. Uh, and so, yeah, it defines virtual networks. Um, it has multiple options with how you can configure a virtual network. So it can be uh, host only, so that would be isolated to just the virtual machine and it wouldn't be connected to anything. Uh, or you can do bridged, so it'll actually be essentially a layer two connection to your physical NIC um, and it can get its own IP address on your network. And it can also run a uh, NAT network for you. So it'll actually uh, handle GHCP for you, uh, and it'll handle the um, network address translation uh, between the subnet that your virtual machine is on and your host machine. Uh, so NAT is really handy when you don't want your virtual machine accessible to other clients on the network. Uh, you just want it to be able to get out, basically, of your machine. Uh, so OS install. So here's where the headless 
uh, setup starts to bite us. Uh, if we don't have a graphical terminal of any kind, um, it's kind of difficult to install an ISO. And if you think about it, it's actually not a scenario you always find yourself in. Uh, even if you're coming from the vSphere world, you probably have a Windows desktop that you log into the vSphere web interface with, uh, and you install at least one, at least your initial image before you, you know, automate things. Uh, you might have to use the graphical installer to do it. Or in any case, you use that to get into the boot options uh, and load something like a kickstart file or uh, other automation there. Uh, so most distro ISOs do not automatically support a serial console. So if they don't see a graphical adapter, they just do nothing. Or they, they don't do nothing. They just assume that you've got something connected and they try and boot as normal. They don't fall back to something like a serial connection. Uh, however, Anaconda, which is the installer um, interface on most uh, distros, at least the enterprise Linux distros, uh, it does support text mode. So if it does detect that it's booted in a text console, not a graphical uh, console, it will switch over to text mode. But you have to get the kernel into text mode first. You have to get that serial console working. Uh, so again, distros are not setting their kernels to use the serial console. So when you boot up your OS by default, it's not even looking for that serial connection uh, to do it. It's looking for that uh, graphic card adapter. Now the limitation around that is we can tell the kernel to use a serial console so that we can do it over text. Um, but we can't get that kernel option into an ISO. And so this is... This is the main limitation, I would say, when doing this. And you'll have to, if you don't have an ISO, or if you don't have the requirements to boot the kernel image, uh, then you'll have to do some workarounds. So in this case, uh, we can use vert install. And if we refer to a, an actual raw kernel image, uh, we can specify those options. If we're just using an ISO, uh, we actually can't specify those. And so the workaround there is using VNC, or rebuilding your ISO with the right boot options. So if you can't specify those kernel options to boot with a serial console enabled, you actually have to essentially unpack your ISO and go into your boot options and edit that and then rebuild your ISO and then boot from that. Uh, so that's a pain in the butt. Uh, if you can avoid doing that, I would recommend that. Um, but I will show you how, uh, as long as you're booting off the network, there is actually an easy way to get those kernel options in. So let's do a demo. Uh, I'm not gonna do an exhaustive demo on KVM. I just wanna show uh, some of the basics of using the command line to run a virtual machine. So let's head over to our terminal. And I'll make this a bit bigger. Now you might be thinking, oh, well, you've got a, uh, you're using this on Windows, so why don't you just forward X and then use the graphical tools that are available? Well, for starters, forwarding X is pretty painful. And so we can boot up the vert manager command. And I have an X server running on this Windows machine. So we'll see if that'll pop up. So you might've seen this before if you've ever played with uh, KVM on Linux. So this is our vert manager tool. And if you've ever tried X forwarding over the internet, waiting. Is it? Oh, I wouldn't use cockpit. Yeah. Yeah. So we can see here that it does work. Uh, it's really laggy, so you can you can push your way through it. Uh, I'm on a fairly close network connection. In fact, uh, Brad's office is on Shaw, and this server is on Shaw, so this is probably about as best a case as it can get. But what if we only have text? Well, we can use the vert sh command. So uh, libvert is primarily 
administered with the vir-sh command. So v-i-r-s-h, virtualization interactive terminal. So this is where we're going to do most of our activity. And so this is talking to libvirt-d, which is running on our machine right now. So if we take a look at our service, we can see here libvirt-d, it's running on our system. So that's what we're interfacing with. And you can see it's got a couple of uh, child services running. It's got DNS masks, so that's doing some of our uh, virtual networking for us, and it's handling all that automatically. So we don't we don't really have to worry about that. So if we go into VRSH and we type help, it's got a whole pile of commands that we can do. Uh, so if you're looking at that and you're going, holy crap, how do I just boot a virtual machine? Um, well, to do it from scratch is a big pain. Uh, so if we take a look at what does a virtual domain look like? So we talked about that XML file for a virtual machine. So let's take a look at that. So if we go to Etsy libvirt, and it should be in here somewhere. I might have to just search for it. There you go. So if we look under Etsy libvirt QEMU, we can see here, here's our XML uh, for our current uh, virtual machine. So this is this is one that I've pre-created. Uh, so I'll just show this to, to take a look at. What does one of these XML files look like? Uh, doesn't even let me read it. So it says, warning, this is an auto-generated file. Changes to it are likely to be overwritten. So this is not the correct way to edit this file. Uh, and I'll show you the correct way in a moment. Uh, this is just showing you where it is on the file system. So our domain type is KVM. So that's telling it to run the virtual machine with KVM. And then we've got a name. We've got UUID. We've got some metadata. We're defining memory, vCPUs, our OS type. And then we sort of get into the weeds with CPU mode, devices, and we have to try and figure out all this CPU stuff, PCI, blah, blah, blah. So we don't really know what, what we want for all these. We've got some networking. We've got some mouse and keyboard stuff. Uh, so we don't want to have to figure all that out. That's way too much. So what we can use instead is the vert install command. So this is a command to provision a new virtual machine. So this figures all that virtualization stuff out automatically for us and gives us a way to just give it a couple parameters, and then it's going to automatically create that XML file for us. So let's take a look at one of those commands. Oh, hold on. Let me. Just a couple of options. It's a little scarier than it looks. So let's put that here where we can read it. So we start at the beginning. Vert install, dash dash name, Fedora 37. That's just a friendly name. Uh, then we define our RAM. So that's defaulting to kilobytes. Uh, so we'll give it 4096, four gigs of RAM. And then Something that is a pet peeve of mine, at least, is command line parameters with spaces in them. Well, it's got lots of those. Yeah. So it's dash dash disk space path, and then equals, uh, and then here we give it a path. So here we're saying Fedora 37 dot Q cow two. So that's QEMU copy on write two. So that's a virtualization, that's a virtual hard drive. Uh, Again, made by QEMU. So that's one of the features that QEMU is providing uh, to the KVM virtualization is it's virtualization, virtualizing your hard drive for you. And one of the advantages of that virtual hard drive format is it supports live uh, snapshots. Uh, it supports uh, revisions to those snapshots. Uh, so you can uh, take those snapshots and then revert to them if you want, or you can actually clone. And yeah, you can, you can live live extend or shrink 
Well, you don't really want to live shrink a file system in general, but you can grow them. And then we put a comma in our command line parameter, and then we say size equals 20. So we've got a flag, and then we've got option one, and then we've got comma option two. So uh, you definitely have to read the man page to figure out some of these uh, parameters. And then we've got OS variant. Uh, I've put down Fedora 31 because that's the latest variant that uh, KVM knows about on this system. And then we're giving it a virtual CD-ROM, and in this case, we give it an ISO. Now, this command wouldn't work on this setup because this ISO, like I said, is not going to support our, um, our serial console without a graphical terminal. So what we can do instead is we could give it a VNC terminal if we wanted, and then we could install it that way. Uh, or we can look at, okay, how would we actually boot up a machine and do an install through text? Uh, so one thing I'll touch on before that is, uh, oh, I didn't even write it down. So if you're wondering where this Fedora 31 came from, uh, if you do OS info query and then you do OS, this is basically every operating system that QEMU knows about. So you can just pick the latest one or the closest one. It's not a huge deal. It doesn't have to be exact, uh, but that's setting some of the CPU optimizations in your virtual OS uh, to match your hardware. So for instance, if you're going to run uh, Windows NT 3.1, uh, you probably don't want to try and give it uh, a network adapter that is 10 gigabit because Windows NT is going to try and puke on a 10 gigabit virtual network adapter. So uh, things like that, you know, if you're, especially if you're running a really old operating system, uh, those become more important than if you're running a, a fairly new operating system. So let's go ahead and install. RVM. So there's a couple more options here in this one, as you can see. So again, we start off with our name. Let's call this mug. So that's our logical name, and we're going to want to remember that uh, because that's going to be how we administer this domain. So we're going to refer to mug anytime we're doing something with this domain. Our RAM, we'll set that smaller. And our disk path, we can name it whatever we want. Um, so you probably want to name it the same as your domain. Uh, you can also have multiple disks attached to your virtual machine. Um, so you kind of have to keep track of that. Uh, that's one thing that the other administration tools help you with is they, uh, they track a lot of that automatically. Um, and you don't have to worry about the back end of your storage and things like that. So this is uh, a bit more bare bones. So now here's the difference. So before we looked at, we were going to specify a CD-ROM and we were going to boot an ISO. But that doesn't let us, the, the limitation is that doesn't let us specify kernel options at boot because it doesn't know how to actually get those options into the operating system that it's booting. What we can do is we can specify the location option instead and we can actually give it a web URL of a kernel image. And so in this case, the uh, Fedora repo on the mug server uh, has a bootable kernel image that we can use. So if we go to mug.ca slash mirror Fedora, and I find my mouse, and we go to Linux, and we go to releases, and we go 37, and we go everything. So now under the ISO folder, those are our disk images that we can boot it up with. But under our, under our OS folder, uh, this is essentially a bootable image, uh, or it's got all of the bootable images that we need for our kernel. So if you look here, we've got uh, install.image, and that's what it's actually looking for. It also has all of our 
packages that are used by net install. Uh, so it can grab all of those as well. So we can get uh, KVM to boot directly off of that network location. So we don't need any kind of ISO at all. We're actually booting off of the HTTP location. And then we tell it we need a serial device, and it's going to be a pair virtual TTY. And I've added in the uh, graphics option for VNC, just because uh, it's nice to have. And then here we have extra args. So this is the arguments that we're actually passing to the kernel that we're booting. So we need to say our console is going to be TTY S0 for our serial console. And then we define that again uh, with our preferred option, which is our serial baud rate of 115.200 and 8. And so that's just our standard serial configuration, no parity, 8 bits. The the console equals TTY S0 is a, I believe it's a failback option. And so it defaults to, I think, 9600 baud. So um, yeah, I was looking at the kernel documentation about that. And it, um, yeah, you can define multiple consoles and it picks the, the best option, basically. So if we hit Enter on that, it'll say starting install. And it's going to allocate our disk. Oop. No, no, go away. We don't need this GUI. So now, if we do ver sh list, we can see that domain mug is running. So now, how do we connect to it? Well, if we do ver sh console, Mug. You can see we've got something coming. So we missed the beginning uh, of what this console was about to print uh, because we can see our lines are cut off. Um, but if we hit R for refresh in this case, We need to. The it doesn't well. It doesn't know about what size your terminal is, so you can see here it's it's overriding itself a bit. Uh, let's see. Here we'll shrink that down. Oh. There we go. So it's. Text mode provides a limited set of installation options. It does not offer custom partitioning, blah, blah, blah. So we have to do everything basically uh, by options. Press yes, press no, press one, press two. Um, so it also has the option to start a VNC. So that's actually separate from KVM. Uh, that's Anaconda, which can run its own VNC server that you could connect to. Uh, or we can run in text mode. So that's what we're going to do. And so now we're in our installer, just like we would be if we were in a GUI. We can uh, pick all of our installation options. Um, and it's a little bit inefficient. We have to list through here, and we have to specify each one manually. We have to go area two, and then we have to find our location in the list, 165 for Winnipeg. And then it's automatically picked uh, our boot location as our installation source. So we're going to install everything right off the mug server. We can pick our software packages if we want. We can say Fedora server, Fedora custom. And we'll skip all that. Installation destination. Uh, it's not super fun to have to partition a disk through this text option, and we don't obviously have all the options. Um, so what we could do instead, if we wanted to, is if we wanted to work around not being able to partition, we can specify some of our mount points. So what you can do is we can mount, we can actually create that uh, virtual disk image ahead of time. And we can mount that as a file system on our host machine. And then we can format that however we want. And then we can attach that back to our virtual machine um, 
and then install it on those pre-existing partitions. So um, that's another workaround that you'd have to do if you needed really custom partitioning and you had to install it through the text option here, uh, text console. Um, but it actually does a decent job. The uh, It gives us the option of using all free space and then we hit continue. And then it does offer us LVM. We hit continue. And then we give it our root password. And we are good to go. So we hit begin installation. it do that for a little bit. So while we're doing that, if we come back here, so now if we take a look at, so to actually edit one of these domains, we can use the versh edit command for our domain. And this is going to open that same XML file that we looked at earlier. So this is the actual way uh, to edit those domain files. And so this this knows where the domain is and it uh, it uh, does it automatically for you. So if we look through here, we should be able to go down in here. And so here we can see, here's our drive type. Uh, so mug.qcow. So if we needed to rename or move our disk for some reason, uh, we would power off the VM and then we would have to go into here and we would edit this path and that would move the disk for us. So that's easy to do there. And if we move further down the list, we can see we've got vert IO serial. So we've got a serial device that we added and then there'll be some more configuration further on down. So here's that PTY device, that serial that we defined. So it's added that, so it figured out all of these XML formatting to actually add that serial device to this virtual machine. So we just had to tell it uh, dash dash serial in the vert install command, and then it figured out what we needed in here to actually enable that. So we can exit out of there. And we'll see, oh, we're not quite done installing yet. Let's see, what else did I wanna show? Uh, so we can uh, manage the power of our virtual machines externally as well as internally. Uh, so we can do a ver sh and we can do a shutdown on Fedora 37. And so that will gracefully shut down the domain. Uh, we can also start it up. We just do ver sh start. Now, if we do a ver sh list, well, how do we know that Fedora 37 exists? because we only see what's running. Well, we can do a ver sh list, dash dash all, and there we see the one that's shut off. So uh, if you're on an unfamiliar system and you don't know what should be there, uh, you just have to go list dash dash all, and then uh, you'll see what's what you're expecting to find there. So we can start that again. We can do ver sh start, Fedora 37. Now the other thing we can do is we can do ver sh undefined. Fedora 37 underscore two, and it's gone. So now libvert has no idea that uh, Fedora 37 two uh, exists. And if we go to uh, Etsy libvert QEMU, we can see that the Fedora 37 XML file is gone. So that's permanently erased and there's no way to get that back. So if you undefine a virtual machine with versh, uh, there's no getting it back. So your disk is still there. If we go over to our disks folder, varlib libvert, we go into disks. We can see that the misspelled Fedora 37 
uh, hard drive file is still there. Uh, so well, none of our data is lost, but uh, we don't know how that virtual machine was configured. So if we were to boot this up again, uh, we would have no idea what, how the virtual machine was actually configured. So that, uh, that undefined command is something you have to watch out for, and don't do that unless you really mean it. And installation is complete. Awesome. All right, so let me just pull that up behind it. So it says rebooting system, so we can just attach to our console again as soon as it boots up. Yep. It powered itself off. So we will ver sh start mook. And we can do ver sh console mug. No, that's live. That's live. Yeah. So if you if you detach from the console uh, with the regular escape command, and then you do ver sh console, oops. Uh, there is no there is no scroll back, so it's not it's not caching any of your console lines. Yeah. So we get a password prompt. Oops. And we're into our serial console. So if you look, we're at TTY S0. So that's basically it. So uh, we installed this virtual machine using purely a text console. And the nice thing, at least, about uh, installs done with that Anaconda installer is it remembers that you need that kernel option. And it puts those into your uh, boot options in Grub. So it will start your kernel with that serial console uh, parameter every time. Now, it doesn't do Grub automatically. So if you wanted to actually get your Grub boot screen, uh, actually, I don't, maybe it did. I can't remember. Let's double check. Oh, there you go. So even Grub. Even Grub knows that you want a serial console, so it puts that in automatically. And so as long as we are in the virtual, in the VerSH console, uh, when Grub shows up, we can get into there. And we could edit our Grub uh, timeout to be longer, so we'd have a better chance of getting in there. And the last command that I will show off is one that seems like it should be much worse than it is which is ver sh destroy mug. Well, it's still there. We just turned it off. But we turned it off ungracefully. Yes, yeah. So that's a little backwards and a little bit disconcerting if you run destroy the first time. It's like, wait, really? Uh, so that's all the commands I had. Uh, does anyone have any questions? Solaris also calls virtual machines domains. Oh, yeah. Mm. Mm. Yeah. Uh, actually, one other thing I meant to mention is that uh, as far as command line tools, uh, ver sh is the only option. But if you're looking at uh, management Management tools that don't require a GUI, uh, there are things like Cockpit and also Proxmox and Overt is another one. Actually, Mark Jenkins presented on that a few years ago. Those are all front ends to KVM. Uh, most of those are web-based. So if you're willing to run all of the extra, uh, extra daemons that you need to, to run those interfaces, then you can get away with having no GUI but at the end of the day, you still need something that can run a web browser. So um, if you want to do it purely by text, this is the way to do it. Otherwise, yeah, you're looking at one of those heavier weight tools uh, to manage your VMs. If you run LSPCI, is there a video card installed in the Riverbolt uh, virtual machine? Or can you run it without a virtual It has, it has no... Um, Actually, it might have one because I, I think I installed it with 
uh, the graphics option. Yeah, it depends on the access. I always that, right? Yeah. You yeah, you can start it with no graphics, and it will it will have no graphics yeah. adapter at all. Yeah. Okay. yeah. The graphics just a console port. Yeah. I think you can do that. Just curious. Yeah, so in this case, it puts one in because I installed it with the um, VNC graphics, basically. So yeah, I, I did omit that on some of my other systems, and yeah, it works fine. Yeah. So what are the typical scenarios where you, you want to install with a serial like this? Uh, the only realistic scenario is one where your server lives in a remote data center and you just want to run one or two virtual machines without the hassle of putting in Overt or Proxmox or any other heavyweight administration tools because it really is completely overkill to run one or two VMs. Uh, it's a lot of extra administration and also, you know, uh, attack vector because, or attack surface because ver SH is only, realistically only accessible by SSH. So as long as your SSH is locked down, you don't have to worry about anyone getting into your uh, virtualization administration. And also, if you screwed something up uh, that you don't have SSH to your virtual machine anymore, and um, even if you can use the virtual manager, sometimes depending on where the VM is, it's laggy as all hell, and uh, the console connection, uh, just a lot less overhead. So yeah. You can SSH to the, ver uh, to the hypervisor yeah. and just uh, use virtual console. That's uh, more often than not that a lot snappier. Yeah, even if you even if you have that graphical option, um, yeah, if you are far away on the network, uh, having just having that serial option, like even if you if you have a bunch of VMs uh, that you normally use the the graphical terminal, just turning on that console option is handy to have if in an emergency. It's the last string to break, so I mean, if you can't access using that, uh, you know you're screwed. So it's nice to have for sure. Um, I'm actually glad our brother mentioned this. Like the, the t I was kind of surprised to start recognizing some stuff from here. The only times when I've seen this, uh, the, the, kind of this approach, would be either in Proxbox, like you mentioned, but also in the, like Linode stuff connects to their VMs like this as well. Like the, some of the the output of the command started to look very familiar. Yeah. I was like, hey. I think OVH also uses kind of similar. Yeah. Not most of them. Yeah, if you look at it, uh, providers, it makes sense for them. Yeah, they build on top of. I think it's um, what's the name of it? Uh, the Red Hat thing. You probably know what I'm talking about. The KVM. No. Overt. No. no, no pro it's uh, a commercial one they offer. Oh, OpenStack. That. Yeah, yeah. If you look, I mean, if you look at most most cheap VPS platforms, will list their platform as either Zen or KVM. And KVM has overtaken pretty much all of the Zen, the Zen ones that used to be more mainstream. Is anyone still using Zen like I think technically AWS is using is using some Zen stuff way like really modified. Like it's not Zen Zen; it's it's their own flavor of that. Um, but even they have been piloting away from that. Pilot. Yeah, well, they basically have written their own stuff at this point. But yeah, so most of the VPS platforms are using KVM under the hood. And so they're, they're all using libvert in some capacity base it, most of the time. So, And that's the advantage of libvert is you write your own front end on top of it, uh, and it does all the heavy lifting. Yeah. That was that. Yeah. Sort of an adjacent question to this. Like, I've noticed this this approach being used in Proxmox. So when you're starting, a, rather than using a VM and doing the ISO install or whatever, if you just use a uh, like an LXC container, it basically just drops you into something like this. 
and it just renders the text in the browser. It doesn't actually like give you a VNC of like a screen or whatever. But a lot of VMs that I'm running are just text, right? So I'd like to just use this instead. But you you, you make it sound like you have to configure the uh, the VM to be able to play ball with uh, serial connections. Would you be able to go into a little bit more detail on how to go about doing that? Uh, well, it's really just that one that one install line that I that I showed. Um, so if we look at uh, so if we log into our machine here. So all we had to do was tell our kernel in this virtual machine to use the serial device, the virtual serial device, as its console. So uh, if we go into uh, boot. That, of course, assumes that the installer script will play along with that. Yes. So that's, that's the main limitation. And all you would need is a prepackaged virtual machine image that was pre-configured to use this serial console. Most of them that I know of, I've never seen one that's pre-configured to do that. Um, okay. Yeah. Oh, wait, hold on, Alberto. Yeah. Yeah. Libvirt is just a front end to essentially to that QEMU KVM command. It just does more of the, uh, more of the automation around some of the networking and things like that. But yeah, if you just want to run the, the VM on its own, uh, the QEMU KVM command works as well. Yeah, so in terms of uh, kernel options, uh, if we look for, so if we cat, oops, grab.cfg, grip. So in our kernel, in our grub boot options, we've told the kernel to enable the console at our TTY S0 device. So that's what this extra flag did in our in our install command here. That basically just said, the first time you boot this kernel up, uh, give it these extra parameters. And that told the kernel to output its console messages to the serial device that we, that we added to this machine. And once it knows about that the first time, it just remembers that. Um, and so from that point onward, what we could do now is we could take this image and we could duplicate it as many times as we want. And any subsequent VM that we create from this image will already have that serial console enabled. Yeah. All right, any other questions? All right, uh, thanks everyone.